Poštovane dame i gospodo, poštovani prorektori, pročelnici, nastavnici, studenti Hrvatskog katoličkog sveučilišta, poštovani prijatelji Hrvatskog katoličkog sveučilišta, dobro nam došli na predavanje profesorice Maje Lukač Štir, raskit s klasičnom filozofijom pomoću semantičke revolucije. Profesorica Lukač Štir, zahvaljujem vam u ime našeg rektora profesora Tanjića i cijele naše akademske zajednice na vremenu kako biste održali ovo predavanje na našem sveučilištu u razvoju još uvijek malo, evo gradimo tamo, pitali ste ovu novu dvoranu, pa nadam se da ćete nam i tamo doći gdje vas možemo ugostiti u većem prostoru, jer vidimo da ima puno zanimanja. Prije predavanja dopustite mi nekoliko riječi o profesorici Lukač Štir, Maja Lukač Štir, profesorica i doktorica filozofije, rođena je u Buenos Airesu, u Argentini, diplomirala filozofiju na Argentinskom katoličkom sveučilištu. 25 godina radila je kao istraživačica političke filozofije. 2013. godine imenovana je predstojnicom katedre za filozofiju na filozofskom fakultetu istoga sveučilišta. Članica je Papinske akademije za filozofiju. Članica Akademije Del Plata u Argentini, članica Instituta za bioetiku, Nacionalne akademije moralnih i političkih znanosti u Argentini, autorica četiri knjige i oko 150 članaka u raznim filozofskim časopisima diljem svijeta. Ako sam nešto pogriješio ili zastavio, profesorica će sigurno nadodat. Evo, meni je drago da je možemo ovdje ugostiti i čut predavanje. Predavanje će biti na engleskome jeziku. Ja se nadam da ćemo poslije ostati u jednoj raspravi malo o tome predavanju. Naslov je intrigantan i čini mi se kako kažu da je filozofija lar por lar u današnjem svijetu, ali meni se čini da je filozofija jedna od najvažnijih disciplina 21. stoljeća, jer moramo razlučiti što je, što nije i jednom se dogodi ovo gubljenje u prostoru i vremenu u kojem živimo. Možemo reći nekako da je paradigma 19. stoljeća bila ova tehničke prirodne znanosti i jedan redukcionizam da 21. stoljeće vapi za jednom sintezom i prostorom otvorenim upravo za društvene i humanističke znanosti koje nam jedine mogu odgovoriti na pitanje gdje smo i kamo idemo i kamo možemo početi. Evo, profesorice, izvolite. Dobar dan, puno vam hvala što ste došli ovo slušati. Zahvaljujem se specijalno osobama koje znam da su ostavili druge poslove, ne samo sad, mislim, i zahvaljujem študentima što su došli svakako, ali isto i prijateljima koji su me došli pratiti. I zahvaljujem svakako katoličkom sveučilištu da ste me pozvali za ovu konferenciju i ispričavam što će to biti na engleskom jeziku, ali meni, da vam pravo kažem, stid me govoriti hrvatski koji moj hrvatski nije akademski jezik. Onda ovo ipak, zato sam rekla, mislim, ja imam, nisam nikad pravila studije na hrvatskom jeziku i kako god sam čitala, ne osjećam se sigurna da vam to pravila iskreno kažem, zato ću na engleskome, ali slobodno možete posle pitati hrvatski. I ja prema tome što ćete pitati, ću odgovarati ili hrvatski ili engleski. Eto tako. It is well known that having graduated at the Catholic University of Argentina, my studies at that stage concern chiefly classical philosophy basically Aristotelian and scholastic. My belonging uh, to the Pontifical Academy St. Thomas Aquinas as a corresponding member is also well known. 
The context above explains why I consider that my humble contribution to Habesian studies consists in showing both its possible continuity with classical philosophy and its break with it. Besides, it is also this position that the reviews of my works in various catalogues and indexes remark as original. The relative continuity between classical philosophy and Herbazian thought, which is in fact indebted to the former more than Hobbes himself would be willing to admit, is evidenced, for instance, in his theory of the passions, such as it appears in the Omine and Leviathan, undoubtedly influenced by Aristotle's rhetorica. On the other hand, it must also be acknowledged that Hobbes manages to put forward a doctrine whose essential trend is to break off with tradition. Due to his, this critical bent, which is clearly evinced in his work and to his branding both Aristotelian and scholastic theories as vain philosophy, he avails himself, however, of classical terminology but adapting it to modern mentality, that is, by stripping the traditional terminological and conceptual instruments from their original sense, and thus elaborating a theory radically opposed to tradition. Therefore, my hypothesis consists in holding that Hobbes performs a rupture with classical and scholastic philosophy by operating an actual semantic turn. I shall try to prove this hypothesis by analyzing the three terms I consider as a key to the development of Hobbes' anthropologic and political doctrine. These are natura, ars, and ratio. Naturally, the list of terms which suffer this semantic turn in Hobbesian philosophy is much longer, but I must respect certain limits so I chose the three above mentioned ones in order to be able to develop my hypothesis in the required time. Notwithstanding, I enumerate by way of example, without seeking to exhaust the list, terms which are involved in that semantic turn. Lex, ius, voluntas, deliberatio, libertas, veritas, autoritas, malum, bonum, amongst others. Let us begin by analyzing the term nature and art, both of which appear in the first lines of the introduction to Leviathan. The concept of nature is one of the props on which the whole Hobbesian doctrine rests, and one of the points where the breaking off with traditional thought, whether it be that of Aristotle or scholastic philosophy, is more evident. According to Aristotle's several definitions in his Metaphysics, the term nature may be explained to many things or processes, to a principle of being, to a principle of movement, or to a constituent element. But all these definitions have something in common. Nature is the essence of beings which possess in themselves, and as such, the principle of movement, and this movement is always directed to an end. Even those who nowadays question that Aristotelian ethics and politics should necessarily depend on his teleological metaphysics do not cast any doubts on the teleological character of his physics and metaphysics. Later on, scholasticism, in particular Thomas Aquinas, follows directly on this subject the statement of Aristotle in Physica II asserting in his commentary that nature is nothing else but reason inserted in things by which they move to a determinate end. Contrarywise, Hobbes breaks off with the teleological world vision on rejecting both formal and final causes, whereby nature is reduced to matter and the effect or efficient causality, mechanically conceived he plainly holds in the corpore. 
the writers of metaphysics reckon up two other causes besides the efficient and the material, that is, the essence, which some of them call formal cause and the end or final cause, both which are actually efficient causes. Movement, which for Hobbes constitutes the entire nature, does not aim at anything beyond itself. It just means the conservation of movement, which does not even have in itself a teleological reason, as it does not express anything different from what is already given. The analytic method applied to the knowledge of natural bodies leads Hobbes to an identification of what is natural with what is primary and elementary. If true knowledge is causal knowledge and the only universal cause is movement, it is natural what derives directly and immediately from the movement of mechanical causes. What is natural is determined in relation to its spontaneous origin, to the way it is generated. But this merely expresses the necessity of natural phenomena without any normative role being derived from it. Neither the exemplary character that Physis might have for Plato, nor the teleological character it would have for Aristotle. Starting from this new concept of nature, the semantic turn expands and evolves in the expression human nature. Hobbesian mechanism and materialism applied to human nature are molded in the introduction to Leviathan, where Hobbes wonders, I quote, for what is the heart by a spring, and the nerves but so many strings, and the joints but so many wheels, giving motion to the whole body, such as it was intended by the artificer? We must remember that these expressions appear in a context in which Hobbes presents man as the most excellent product of nature, which is in its turn the art through which God, the artificer, has made and governs the world. By denying it to have a substantial form, Human nature is reduced to a set of powers, and human life is nothing but a moving system. For Hobbes, nature does not express an essence, but a sum of faculties and powers. This is why in his treatise of human nature, first part of the elements of law, he defines mind nature as the sum of his faculties and natural powers such as nutrition, movement, generation, sense, and reason. Having rejected the notion of form, Hobbes cannot give an essential definition of man, but makes, as we have just pointed out, a description of human behavior. The movements that make it up as performed by man are not different from other movements performed by natural bodies. In this way, there is no difference at all between action and behavior. For Hobbes, in fact, man has no capacity to act or produce a different movement to that of other moving bodies, be they animate or inanimate. His capacity to reason, to desire what is desirable, even admitting that it belongs solely to man, is also explained on the basis of efficient causality. Everything in the world reacts to external stimuli, stimuli, and man is no exception. The mechanistic view implies the denial of any intentional structure. In this way, without considering any finality in nature, the faculties cannot be conceived as operating powers, as having a reality different from their actual exercise. The doctrine of powers, characteristic of Aristotelian anthropology and later of scholastic anthropology, is deprived of any explanatory value in Hobbesian anthropology. One cannot speak of capacities in a strict sense because admitting that they have a potential or intentional character means to deny them actual existence. 
because faculties justify themselves as powers, and these are such insofar as they exercise themselves. Neither is there any difference between man and animal since human behavior is considered natural when it is determined by affections that are common with the rest of animals, because natural man is man considered as a mere animal. In the corpore, Hobbes had already outlined the general principles of psychology, showing that men only differ from animals in their ability to impose names, in their disinterested curiosity, and in their desire to know the causes of things. The breaking of the correlation between nature and end has as a consequence the impossibility of attributing the, to nature a normative role, not being possible to interpret man's actions as direct to an end, which in its terms be perfectible, Hobbes deems natural everything that issues spontaneously from man, such as his passions, insofar as they are the result of the action of external things on vital motion, as he asserts in Leviathan 6. In brief, what is natural in man is identified and reduced to passional. Let us see in what follows how Hobbes links art and its derived notions such as artifice and artificial to nature. At first, such as the reference to art appears in the introduction of Leviathan, it would seem that Hobbes keeps for this term the classical notion of imitation of nature, because he refers to the art of man as the power to recreate the given. In the same text, he calls nature the divine art through which God governs the world. In subsequent lines, he refers to the artificial animal, to artificial life, and to the artificial soul of the artificial man all of them related to the creation of the great Leviathan or commonwealth, that is, the state men create for their own safety and defense. And defense. Although one notices the use of metaphoric language, it may also be observed that the appraisal is not pejorative, but rather that is that it transcends, transcends the artificial as a result of a human activity that sets man on a level with God. In this last nuance consists the subtle semantic term that Hobbes applies to the concept of art. Unlike classical philosophy, for which art can take nature as a model and employ it, its principles to carry out its own work, without pretending to excel the perfection of nature. Hobbes considers art precisely as superior, since it provides a certainty that we cannot obtain from nature, since we can only have an absolutely certain knowledge of such things as we ourselves make. Fascinated by Euclidean geometry, Hobbes concludes that we can only have absolute certainty or scientific knowledge of those things which we ourselves have caused or whose construction is in our power or depends upon our own will. In what we ourselves create, there is nothing which remains unknown, nor do we need any hypothetical argument as the ones used in natural sciences. The possibility of making up the principles of a science has a direct influence on Hobbesian politics, since this becomes a construction in which absolute and arbitrary elements are combined. It was this possibility of building up and, ma and manipulating which caused Sheldon Walling to call the Hobbesian view of science and politics despotic. As the geometer knows a priori in the figures what he himself has put into them as causes, according to Hobbes, the propositions of politics can also be demonstrated 
with absolute certainty as we ourselves produce their principles, that is to say, their laws and contracts. This makes him attach a higher value to art as a human possibility of constructing what is demonstrable than to nature, whose principles may be capriciously concealed from man in order to prevent his attaining an absolute power. The valuation of the artificial reaches its highest point in the conception of an artificial person identified with a mortal god to whom we owe our the immortal god our peace and security and to whom hopes and trust salvation because in the artificial person the state of nature is legally transcended. The state of Ayatan is the result of a compact a construction of reason. In order to build up the sovereign power, man may use his natural force and the effect will be a republic or state by acquisition. He calls it commonwealth by acquisition. Or he may employ his rational calculus and we shall have a republic or state by institution. He called it commonwealth by institution. But in both cases, sovereignty is the effect of a human artifice and its essence is anything but natural. The instauration of the civil society disrupts the natural order and transforms the balance of forces. To the natural equality of individuals, the contract opposes the inequality between sovereign and subjects, the former being the one who imposes an absolute order and demands absolute subjection. For Hobbes, sovereignty is not achieved but in virtue of a transference of natural rights of every man to the artificial man, which is Leviathan. We may wonder whether it is merely an obsession with certainty that makes Hobbes inclined to place art over nature, or if there may be some other reason. My answer would be to the obsession with certainty, we must add the yearning for overpowering natural reality, characteristics of modern rationalism, and the Hobbesian obsession with security and, pay and peace. I base myself for this latter assertion on the text of the dedicatory episode of the Kiwe, where Hobbes holds that if we knew the nature of human actions with the same certainty with which we know the nature of quantity in geometrical figures, the force of ambition and greed would become weaker and humanity might enjoy an everlasting peace. If we take into account that the first and fundamental law of nature is for Hobbes to seek peace, we shall understand the importance he might attach to the construction of a science that should warrant it. It might also be explained why he rejects so passionately the traditional political philosophy which resigns itself to the limitation of its knowledge and the uncertainty of its results, which are unavoidable due to the indeterminate character of its objects, insofar as this political knowledge be understood as a prudential knowledge. The political science whose fatherhood he assumes and which was to substitute for traditional politics had to warrant the achievement of peace by starting the construction, organization, and efficient sustenance of the Leviathan, or of state Leviathan. Paraphrasing Wilhelm Hennis, what is particular of Hobbes' political philosophy lies in the combination of a theoretical ideal of knowledge with poetic presuppositions. Regarding the, um, it's not poetic, but poetic from the Greek presuppositions. Regarding the theoretical uh, ideal, ideal, the Malmesburian philosopher is concerned with the rigorous necessity of its objects, which have in themselves the principle of movement. But at the same time, this theoretical ideal is combined with poetic presuppositions because opposing tradition 
for which society exists by nature so that men can and should live well following virtuous tracks. Hobbesman is the artisan who must build up civil society and the state, becoming a citizen by his own efforts on the basis of a political technique, which implies ability and skill rather than prudence. Summing up, the rupture with classical philosophy is accomplished substituting for traditional philosophy, which aims at the common good, through an upright and just behavior, a poetic philosophy aimed at building up and efficiently creating peace and security. We still have to analyze the third term, reason, and then see its connection with the Hobbesian notion, notions of nature and art. In Leviathan, Hobbes defines reason as calculus. He was surely convinced of presenting an innovating definition that would reflect the influence of the Euclidean method of mathematics, which had so dazzled him and which in its turn should mean a rupture with the philosophical tradition. Without denying its foundation to the Hobbesian conviction, we may remark that calculus had already been considered by Aristotle himself as part of reason. In his Nicomachean Ethics, Tologisticon is translated by the English scholar Ross and Barnes, as well as by the French Tricot, as the calculative part, which is one of the two parts of rational soul. Both the English and the French versions go on to assert that to deliberate and to calculate are one and the same things. The semantic turn in this case consists in emphasizing that reason is nothing else but calculus. That is to say, it is identified with a reductionist notion of reason because unlike classical philosophy, Hobbesian reason does not admit other parts. It's just calculus. Hobbes does not acknowledge the possibility of their existence something analogous to the Aristotelian nous or the scholastic intellectus, which open up the possibility of an intellectual intuition. We may again be tempted to inquire what reason impelled Hobbes to adopt the paradigm of calculus for the whole of rationality. I think the reason is clear in the light of what was developed above. To universalize the method of calculus as a homogeneous methodological plan for all the sciences in order to warrant two fundamental aspects of the new modern science, certainty and practical power. Persuaded by the Baconian dictum, knowledge is power, Hobbes turns it into the end of knowledge is power, scientiam propter potentiam. Due to this, Hobbesian reason is no longer a natural light of man's, a power, such as it was presented by classical philosophy, reducing itself to a mere instrument for power, a far-sighted and calculating operation or faction which reduces itself to its exercise, as is gathered from Hobbes' definition of reasoning in the corpore. I quote, by reasoning, I understand reckoning. Now, to reckon or calculate is either to join together the sum of many things that are added or to know the result that remains when something has been subtracted from some other things. Reasoning, therefore, is the same as addition and subtraction. Following the resolutive compositive method propounded by Hobbes, addition would be equivalent to synthesis or composition and subtraction to the resolutive analysis. The concept of reasoning reduced the two fundamental operations of addition and subtraction is all stated in Leviathan where he adds, I quote, if it be done by words, is conceiving or the, of the consequence of the names of all the parts to the name of the whole, 
or from the names of the whole and one part to the name of the other part. This reason, calculus, is just a form of establishing relations as may be deduced from the quoted texts, and no intellective character is now attributed to it. Finally, we shall briefly examine the relation between nature, art, and reason, such as these notions and their derivatives are combined in Hobbes' works. Once Hobbes had pres has presented the natural condition of humanity in Leviathan, or the state of nature in the Kiwe, he sets forward the way out from this sickly condition by two means, that is, either by way of the passions that induce to peace, and by means of reason, which calculates the convenience of laying down our rights to everything so as to preserve ourselves. It is to be observed then how reason in its function of calculus and foresight is applied to nature so as to dispose the things we must do or omit in order to preserve our life. From this ordering comes the law of nature which Hobbes defines in the Kiwe as the dictate of right reason. This allows us to hold that paradoxically the so-called law of nature does not have nature as its immediate foundation, but reason in its functions of calculus and foresight. The order and measure established by reason are, for Hobbes, something artificial with a positive meaning that, as we have seen, he attributes to this character, because order and measure ensure and impose themselves from outside to what is natural. That the law has its source in nature means that what is natural as a disorderly impulse is subjected by it to a rule. This regulation is the work of reason that, such as Hobbes conceives it, only provides a capacity to control. The very lack of finality in nature to which we referred before has as a consequence to consider as not natural, that is to say as artificial, everything that implies direction, order, or regulation. Finally, the rationalization of nature is, in a, is an extrinsic one and therefore artificial. In a word, that it does not find its own foundation in what is natural, but only the matter upon which it operates. The last paragraph is a sample of the conceptual results which Hobbes achieves by the semantic turn it performs. The rapture with classical philosophy is evident. The Hobbesian revolution has, on the history of philosophy, the same impact as the Copernican revolution has on science. Both in philosophy and in science, there is no going back. They will never be again what they were for classical antiquity and the Middle Ages. That's all, thanks. Može biti mikrofon bolje, jer ja ne slušam dobro ko govite tiho. Molim, profesore. Kako vi vidite današnju neku rupturu u filozofskom smislu? Gdje je svijet danas rupturalno? Je li to ruptura već se dogodila, već je prava? Koliko je duboka? Kako je smo pukotini? I što slijedi? da malo po suvremenim vaš hopsen pristup. Profesor Leo Strauss, koji je sigurno dobro poznat po ljudima koji se bave političkom filozofijom, već je on to i prorekao toliko godina unazad u Čikagu. Trebamo se vratiti na tu tradišan, jer 
ako se nekako ne vratimo, ne kažem da se vratimo, zato kažem, ne može se već vratiti u prošlost, nije ono što tražimo, nego tražimo da ono što je vrijedno ostane. Svakako, ja mislim da ipak sva ova moderna filozofija je sve do sada još uvijek tako utjecajna, jer nema skoro političkih filozofa u sadašnjem svijetu, specijalno amerikanci, da u nekoj mjeri ne slijedu onako hopsa u ovome što sam ja rekla. Mogu nekako to modulirati, ali eto, još uvijek je on previše prisutan u našoj... Zato sam isto mislila da možda to bude interesantno tu, jer ova semantična revolucija je možda nešto što bi se, vjerujem ja, trebalo dogoditi možda u Hrvatskoj s time da neka terminologija bi trebala se malo pretvarati, ali u pozitivnom smislu. Kad bi se to postiglo, onda ja mislim da bi bili na pravom putu da hrvatska znanost bude u globalnoj kulturi koliko i treba. Neću da omalovažavam nikako, nemojte uzeti to na loše, nego specijalno u socijalnim znanjima i u filozofiji, mislim da nekako još je previše strogo držana ta terminologija koja možda već ima 50 godina nije više interesantna. Eto, oprostite ako nekoga vrijeđan, ali mislim, kako ste me pitali, kako ste me pitali za future, ne, onda sam ipak rekla moje mišljenje. Ja vam kažem to zbiljan, samo onako koliko ja mogu pratiti iz Argentine, šta se događa u filozofskom svijetu, pa isto i pratim neke filozofe iz Hrvatskog filozofskog fakulteta i tako, jer ipak ima nekih koji se bave sa Hobbesom isto. Tako, imam i čitam da malo postignem jedan bolji akademski jezik, ali ispričam se to, već sam se ispričala, ni na novo ako griješim da uzmete to kao, recimo, ipak ja sam osoba koja nije nikad studirala u Hrvatskoj, ništa. A to mi, to stavljam za stare dane, možda kad budem potpuno penzionirana, dođem tu da napravim kroatikum, onako, ne znam ako će me vidjeti pre staru da napravim kroatikum, onda da onda usavršim malo hrvatski akademski jezik. Puno vam hvala. Molim. Svijet se danas nalazi u vremenu koji je jako nepredvidiv. Hobbes je uvijek bio temelj realizma u međunarodnim odnosima. Uvijek je bio. U kojoj mjeri je on danas još izraženiji nego što je bio u prošlosti i da li je vama poznato tko savjetuje predsjednika Trumpa koji se vraća natrag nekakvim tradicijama. Hvala lijepo. To je recimo tradicionalno da se uzme Hobbesa ko primjer za internacionalne veze, da, i međunarodne odnose. Doduše nema toga previše akademski obrađeno, da vam pravo kažem, ali da, ovako ko uzme se to ko politički realizam, ne, i u tom smislu svi kažu tamo sve dolazi od Hobbesa pa unaprijed, ne, jer svakako za Hobbesa razne države su uvijek neprijatelji, uvijek su in state of nature, ne može se doći do jednog commonwealth, mislim, za njega nije moguće misliti na globalizaciju. Kad bi se čovjek pitao je li je za njega moguća globalizacija, on nije o tome govorio, ali iz njegovih dijela možete vidjeti da globalizacija za njega je nemoguća. A sada, 
Ako već mislite kako je to dan danas u, u realnosti i ah, recimo tu i tamo može se dokazati da neke stvari možda idu, ako je Brexit engleski, može biti da englezi slijedu svog, ne, ne kažem da je to ono što je vodilo, ali mol, moglo bi se uzeti, eto, Hobbes je englez, sada englezi odlučili, odlučili, i koji englezi, to je interesantno, najstariji, ne mladi, mladi nisu bili za Brexit, jel da? Onda, mislim, ima tu neke stvari koje može se imati u vidu, ali svakako ja svake godine predajem na političkim znanostima za doktorat jedan seminar o Hobbesu. Sam rekla ja direktoru, pa čujte, ja mislim da su već, da, ja sam vas već dosadila s ovim, uvijek nešto o Hobbesu, uvijek nešto novo, ali uvijek, kaže ne, ne, slušajte, mi vas trebamo jer e, to se ne vidi dovoljno u, dok su... U, mislim, na studijama prije doktorata i onda to trebaju dobro znati jer zapravo on je prisutan stalno među nas i to treba otkriti i od tog otkrića treba se znat treba se moć nastupiti ako imamo to u vidu i sad neke, neke nacije to više vode i neke vlade više vode neko druge Moglo bi se reći, ja sam rekla Brexit, ali može biti da Orban u Mađarskoj. Neću sad ulaziti probleme što će poslije moj sin možda meni reći šta je to. Ali sad smo izvan, izvan i, i nisam ni to ja s njime imala vremena razgovarati uopće da vam kažem. To je samo moje mišljenje ko argentinski observer. Hm? Da, da znamo, da nema tu nikakvog... To, to je ono što ja možda vidim i sad... Jel će biti da se, da se opet mogu složiti e, mislim, od svake nacije interesi sa jednim globalnom interesom za cijeli svijet? To treba biti, u, u tome je stvar dijaloga, ne? zapravo. Tu treba puno komunicirati međusobno i ljudi dobre volje. Vraćam se na to, ako nema ljudi dobre volje, nema komunikacije. Molim. Sad pitanje od onoga ko nije slušao predavanje, odmah se ispriča. Ja sam ostavila prorektoru. Da... Odlično, hvala vam. Ja ću se i kasnije ispričati, ali mene zanima jedno, zadnje ste to spominjali Hopsa, ovo što sam čuo, ne znam da li ste uopće o tome govorili, Hops i teologija, mene sad kao svećanika i teologija, ali isto ti po tim političkim vidom, ne da sam čitao neke interpretacije od nekih poznatih talijanskih filozofa, Giorgio Agamben recimo, da, da. koji je napisao jednu knjigu, sad on kaže, Hopsa bi trebalo ponovo čitati kroz teološke oči. Omo sakar. Da, ali i kasnije on sad je izdao baš jedno dijelo, on kaže, jer zadnji kapitol, ako se ne varam, Levitijan, Levitijana, niko ne uzima ozbiljno ili ne bavi se njima, on zapravo govori tamo o teološkim, korijenima, svega onog što govori, pogotovo vezano uz knjigu otkrivenja. Do, možete li mi reći nekog iz vašeg iskustva bavljenja Hobbesom, pa bavljenja i srednjom vijekom filozofijom i s obzirom na ovaj raski s klasičnom filozofijom, e, na koji način bi možda upravo ta teološka tradicija iz vaše perspektive isto se mogla tu uključiti? Jer meni je isto jasno da se sve promijenilo. Danas je e, sve ono što se radilo možda od Hobbesa pa na ovamo, pa čak i u politici pa čak i odnosu između crkve i države, dakle da su to politički paktovi koji se dogovaraju između različitih institucija, različitih cijelina, da je to u ovom globalnom svijetu nestalo, da se nalazimo pred jednim sasvim novim, novim svijetom. Ali možete li mi reći taj, evo, Hobbes i teološki, teološki njegov utjecaj, to je zapravo utjecaj teologije i Biblije na Hobbesa, ovako iz vašeg viđenja i bavljenja Hobbesom. Znate, ima tu baš jedna, jedna tendencija koja dolazi od Šmita pa nadalje i sada opet Agamben je preuzeo to nekako, jer zapravo ta njegova najvažnija, na, najvažnija knjiga Levajatan ima četiri dija, dija, da, dio, dijela, četiri dijela, onda. 
Uglavnom se do sada uvijek samo sve osvrnulo na dva prva koji su politički, a dva zadnja je cijela recimo teološka, ali sada tu teologiju njegovu recimo treba isto promatrati sa strane engleske crkve, mislim. On je apsolutno antivatikanist, mislim on je antirim antipapa, antirim, onda i zašto najviše? Jer on smatra da se ne može dijeliti power, mislim, moć. Moć je samo jedna. Ako se dijeli moć između možda pape i poglavara ili kako bilo sovereign, onda tu nema prave moći. Moć je samo jedna i zato on predstavlja ko ideal da moć bude crkva u, mislim, u kengu, kralju. Mislim, onda je on samo od kraljestva govorio, pa onda kralj treba biti glava nacije jedne i glava, politička glava, ali isto crkvena glava. Zato je to Christian king. Christian kingdom, trebalo bi biti. A on kaže da su katolici zapravo, mislim papa, nije dobro razumio sveto pismo. Jer da je Krist rekao da ovo nije njegovo kraljestvo, nije on kralj zemaljski, i da to papa nije tako razumio i zato vi svećenici svijedite loše. Mislim, imate loš put što mislite da ste vi sada slijedite Kristove. Trebalo bi biti ovako. Vi trebate biti, mislim, vaš šef treba biti vaš presjednik sada, ajdemo rečeno, za ne reći vaš kralj. U ono vrijeme bio kralj, bi bio vama sve. I tako, ali... Mislim da isto je pretjerano dati veliku važnost teologiji nad političkom mislju Hobbesa. Jer ja mislim da on upotrebljava, to je recimo teza, uglavnom se zna da su dve teze jedna vizavi druge ko protivne, Strauss sa jedne strane, Schmidt sa druge, Karl Schmidt. I onda... Šmit daje to previše važnje, mislim da on čak govori o jednoj teološkoj politici, dok Strauss kaže da to je, da Hobbes upotrebljava teološke koncepte za političku svrhu. Ja više vjerujem da je to i politički koncept, jer to isto ide nekako sa ovim mojim predavanjem. Mislim, on uzme terminologiju, pa posle to postavi, a njemu perfektno dođe to za apsolutizam koji on i tražio, da misli da kralj treba biti ko bog u ovoj zemlji. Onda ta figura boga nije toliko koliko je on vjernik, nego koliko moć može. I kad on razlaže teme u drugim knjigama o teologiji, onda baš od Boga samo kaže, mi samo možemo reći da postoji i da je svemoćni. Drugo ništa ne možemo, jer sve drugo što se kaže o Bogu, to su naša stvarališta ko ljudi. Zato mislim da je korektnije u ovom smislu prepoznati da ima tu teologičih koncepta koji Hobbes uveze u političke svrhe. Molim.
I would like to uh, ask you about a more metaphysical question uh, concerning about uh, the final cause and the uh, efficient cause. Oh, I'm not a Hobbes scholar, so please uh, forgive me if I, I get some things wrong, but uh, it's, it, it seems, and I grant you that he uh, made some kind of a semantic revolution, but I do not think that is the whole story, because it seems to me that he has a uh, uh, we, we can we can interpret his as uh, giving uh, uh, a kind of a new explanation for some things. For example, if we have a final cause uh, and efficient cause, so final cause, an agent with a final cause would like to achieve some end, but uh, he represents his end as, as some good or something he would like to achieve. But uh, that end is something which which will be the state of the world in the future, and uh, now. Uh, uh, because uh, the human beings can represent the things, we, we have intentionality in today's terms. And uh, of course, but if I would like to achieve, or an agent, if, would li if he would like to achieve some end, then I have to, or an agent has to uh, undertake some actions. And that actions are in fact caused by my representation, my mental representations of the end I would like to achieve. So only we can, I think that today we can explain the final cause in the series of efficient causes. There is, not, there is no different kind of causation as a final cause. Okay, we can say something, there is a final cause, but final cause consists only in a series of efficient causes which stems from the, the possibility of mental causation that our mental states uh, cause other mental states and cause our actions. So I think that some kind of a new explanation can be attributed to Hobbes, not just a semantic revolution that he really, in fact, uh, 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 give, uh, he gave some new explanations of the phenomena, because parsimony is always something good in philosophy. If we can explain all the things with the lesser entities, that, that's the better for philosophy. So what, what would you like to say I, I'm not against the final causes, but I would I would interpret it today in 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 a, in a series of efficient causes. And what is the difference between the nature and uh, and the human beings? Is that the human beings have uh, as a mind have uh, mind has intentional states, and nature does not have intentional states. That, that that's the uh, essential difference between between human beings, their souls and minds, and the nature on the other side, which is what it is, as God created the or, or so. Yes. Oh, thank you very much for your question. I will answer it also in English. Um, this, you have to, uh, perhaps you are right when you are saying that when man, man's action or human action uh, may have a, a, a kind of end, if not final end, because uh, what is voluntary, it has a sense, but a sense, no, in a sense of an end, because the sense is to maintain human being in movement. And here I am firmly uh, concerned that his, uh, his explanation of natural philosophy is very deep and near his political philosophy. And he explains better in natural philosophy this mechanism which I have referred to. That's to say, a mechanistic uh, view and materialistic view makes so that whatever you as a human being decide, it will be in order not to felicity or some sumum bonum, which for him does not exist, but in order to maintain in movement, because moving, moving, that's, you are alive and perhaps his his best, uh, better uh, definition about what human being desires, it will be maintain uh, to be alive. And to be alive is being in movement. 
So whatever conduces a human being to movement as a permanent state, that means while I are moving, I are alive. And when I have no movement, that's the death and that's the worst I can obtain. That's the thing. So there is not, a, an, and he is very clear when he defines felicity, but I suppose that it's enough for a text for another conference. Because felicity is not attaining a summum good, a summum bonum, there is not summum bonum, but containing, renew the desire. That's the felicity for Hobbes. You must renew your desires, and so you are alive. And still you desire something, you are alive. And that's, the, that's what is deciding my action as a human being in order to maintain permanent desires. I hope perhaps we can talk afterwards about it. Thank you very much for the objection. Zahvaljujem profesorici Štir na njenom predavanju. Koristim prigodu da vas još jednom sve srdačno pozdravim. Zahvaljujem prorektoru i prorektorima što su dočekali našu gošću mjesto meni. Ispričavam se, ja sam bio na danu fakulteta, Katoličko Bosno fakulteta iz Karinalo, velikim i našim kancelarom, to je malo duže trajalo. Ja se mogu ispričati, ne znam kako će se ministar ispričati mami, ali to ću sad ostaviti za neki drugi put. Ovoga... Evo, drago nam je da ste naša gošća danas. Hvala vam lijepo što ste prihvatili naše predavanje. Mi smo već prošle godine razgovarali o mogućoj suradnji između dvaju katoličkih sveučilišta, onoga kojem je veliki kancelar bio današnji papa, sadašnji papa Franjo, kojega i vi poznajete. I drago nam je da je ovim predavanjem o filozofiji zapravo ta suradnja počela, jer filozofija je kraljica među znanostima, ja vjerujem da će se kolega Pečnja, kojeg sam vidio da je pitan, je postavio, ne vidim ga gdje sad sjedi, a evo ga, tu stoji, stoji da će se ovoga kao i svi drugi složiti. Želio bih isto tako istaknuti da je profesorica, doktorica Štir, došla ovdje još jednom iz jedne druge prigode, koja je meni posebice isto draga, a to je ovi dana se zapravo održao jedan, ja bih rekao, događaj, Croatian Women Network, ženska mreža, evo ovdje je osnivačica, gospođa Karolina Spivak, koja je, a ja sam jednim dijelom isto uključen u to, kao član žerija, moram reći, odlučila zapravo pokrenuti jednu mrežu da se valorizira rad žena, hrvatski žene u dijaspori i hrvatica ovdje i da ih se međusobno povezuje. S obzirom da je gospođa Spivak rođena u Njemačku, odrasla u Kanadi, a mislim da je to nekako u ingerenciji ministarstva i vanjskih poslova, zapravo jedno lijepo povezivanje, jedan lijepi događaj. Među nagrađenim ženama, evo to je poticaj našim studenticama posebice oko dana žena, je i gospođa profesorica dr. Maja Štir. Ja njoj čestitam i na toj nagradi, ona se našla među 25 žena koje imaju različite životne pripovijesti, različite uspjehe od leadershipa, kako se to kaže danas moderno engleski, dakle od vodstva do ekonomskog života, medijskog, kulturnog i znanstvenog, pa i ovim filozofskom. I drago mi je da je i filozofija na ovaj način i sve ono čime se vi bavite, sve ono što radite, vaša stručnost, vaša važnost, ali u tom povezivanju, evo, i Hrvatske, i Argentine, i katoličkih sveučilišta, da je to prepoznato. Dakle, čestim vam i na toj nagradi, zahvaljam još jednom na vašem dolasku, na ovome predavanju. Evo, to je obogačenje za našu akademsku zajednicu i siguran sam da će i u onom sklopu koji postoje razmjene predavanja Instituta za filozofiju i Hrvatskog katoličkog sveučilišta, zapravo ovdje je filozofija u raznim oblicima jačati, evo na čemu posebno zahvaljujem prorektoru za znanost na njegove organizacije. Još jednom, hvala vam lijepo na dolazku, hvala vam lijepo što ste prisustovali ovom 
predavanju. Pozdravljam naravno i gospodina ministra i njegove suradnike iz ministarstva i sve vas, drage goste našeg sveučilišta. Nakon ovoga vas pozivam na jedno da bude ovo pravi simpozion i agape. Pozivam vas naravno na druženje u vječnicu. Korizmeni je petak, ali nešto ćemo naći. Mi katolici uvijek nešto nađemo, neki izmicaos, evo, neka hopsu bude krivo, barem s te strane što se toga tiče na našem katoličkom dijelu, pa nek on bude nama zavijen. Jedan, profesorice Štir, jedan mali znak pažnje za vaš dolazak, evo, kao jedan poklon, jedna sitnica, hvala vam lijepa. Hvala vam lijepa.